Alex Gladstone, how are you, man? Great. Um, I'm really looking forward to you coming to my hometown of Bedford. I can't wait. Um, it won't be, you know, on a plane in Africa. Nope. Uh, and it won't be many of the other places we've been, but I think it'll be very unique and it'll be my first time in Bedford. So well, you know, you, you've introduced me to a lot of things, a lot of amazing people. But for me, having you come there and tell you my project is just exciting. So thank you for agreeing to come and thank you for... Human Rights Foundation for sponsoring. We really do appreciate that. But we're not going to focus on that. Uh, my first question comes from um, something I've seen of yours, but I've never heard you tell it before. But I think it's quite an, kind of interesting. Can you tell me how you, as a human rights activist and human rights uh, campaigner, b became convinced that Bitcoin was a very important tool for human rights? We should start by just saying that I'm very skeptical. So my organization does personality tests when we hire, and I score a 99 out of 100. So in any large crowd, I'm usually easily the most skeptical person. And that was a painful uh, feature to have as part of my personality, as it turns out. Um, you know, we, we first observed Bitcoin being used as a use case uh, in, in 2011. Uh, I had met Julian Assange uh, when he spoke at the conference that I organized, the Oslo Freedom Forum. I met him in person, physically, in Norway in 2010. It was a very dramatic moment. He had just released Collateral Murder. Uh, th there was a lot of security around. It was it was a very memorable time. And, you know, we followed Julian and we we kept up. And we saw a year later in June of 2011 that he had, he had posted a Bitcoin address to the WikiLeaks Twitter account. And... Um, at the time, we were like, that's interesting, huh? And, you know, look, it appeared to work to some degree, you know, from our perspective. But Bitcoin was so early then. It was such like a, like a, basically like a science experiment. You know, it, it didn't really seem like it would actually move the needle, but it, it just was the sort of first little inkling, right? Uh, and again, remember that the exchange rate was, you know, way less than $100 at the time. So this thing was not anywhere close to being mainstream or believable. And it's not like I could have, even if I wanted to have gone to my organization and said, hey, we should adopt this thing. Um, so there's kind of a chronology that had to happen, right? And, and it did. And a couple of years later, we saw it again when some Ukrainians reached out to us in 2013 and said, hey, Yanukovych, the, the Putin puppet who was in Ukraine, shut down our bank accounts. Will you help us do a fundraiser? And uh, Kasparov, who still is our chairman, was open-minded about the idea there's still a Reddit thread from, from 2013 where this is described, where Kasparov and Atrep helped these guys, and these men and women, do a, uh, a fundraiser from inside Ukraine. And that later turned into the Maidan Square Revolution, like some of the activities they were doing. And we saw, again, how Bitcoin, as a use case, was able to get value to people, even though the government didn't want them to receive value from abroad. So that was like another little, hmm. And these things just kept happening and accumulating. and Donors started giving us Bitcoin, donating Bitcoin to us. We started seeing, hmm, this could be interesting. But again, we just were, we were like, we opened some, we opened a Coinbase wallet in 2014 to accept these donations. And we didn't really, we thought it was such a novelty. We were like, whatever. We actually forgot about it for like several years, which was, ended up being very positive. Um, but it wasn't really until 2016, early 2017 that we, we were like, okay, this, this thing merits a serious look. And, you know, that that was five years of being skeptical, right? So I do empathize with people who, who are slow, a little slow on the uptake. Um, then again, that was a very different time, right? You know, that was a very different time. Today, it, it is harder for me to be patient with people, you know, given how mainstreamed Bitcoin is. Back then, it was a huge risk, even reputationally, to be involved with it. I mean, even though Bitcoin is freedom technology, it was hard to shake the PR cloak at the time that it was drug money. That would that would be very hard to shake back then, right? But we live in different times now. You know, now there's an ETF and there's worldwide adoption and nation state adoption and countries mining. And you know, if you're paying attention to this carefully, it's it's hard for me to believe that that you don't see what's happening here. Um, again, it took us a while, but eventually we started doing programming and learning. I mean, the, the the way I've been able to try to make an impact in the space is by learning from people in my 
sort of from my previous career, right? So from, from 2007 to 2017, I was working with democratic movements around the world with at-risk journalists, with opposition leaders, with people under fire. And I built up a network personally of uh, people in almost every country who I could rely on in terms of on the ground intelligence, what's happening, you know, people that I knew I could support later in life if, if I wanted to make a difference in those places. And I use that network today. And, and that network is now being, you know, empowered because they're now adopting Bitcoin as a, as a financial freedom tool. And a lot of that's behind closed doors, but a lot of it's very, very exciting. And uh, fortunately, the work that I've been doing and that HRF has been doing caught the eye of many, many people who were very influential and they wanted to learn about this and get involved. A lot of this was because of appearances I made, you know, starting on your show, man, six years ago, uh, more than six least, years ago. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so many other people who've given us a platform and supported us, but it, you know, a lot of the goodwill we get these days, I don't have to go find. It's really interesting. It's kind of the ikigai idea, mm -hmm. right? When you're kind of in your ikigai and you're doing something you love and you can support yourself and you're changing the world, it's like things kind of fall into place. It's pretty cool. So people just reach out to us and they're like, hey, can we help? Like, yes, let's do it. You know, it, it's not it's not the traditional human rights, um, let's say, uh, genre of having to just sort of beg for money and attention all the time, which can be very depressing. And that's rea that's the reality for most human rights activists, right? They're just begging for time and money from people, and that's not a very positive and kind of psychologically stable position to be in. It's so much better to be, you know, in a position where people are trying to come to you to help. And it's fascinating that Bitcoin did that, right? Like, you know, who knows what my career would have been without Bitcoin. I'm sure I would have accomplished some cool things and, and done some good, but this is this thing's been like a superpower. It's incredible to see what what it's it helped us been able to do, actually. And we're just getting started. Yeah, so I think it's six and a half years ago, possibly, that we first recorded. You were certainly in the first era of what Bitcoin did and ever since. And you've not obviously we're now friends and we mm -hmm. hang out and speak a lot. But you've had um, a lot more influence on me in other ways. In that, I tend to think a lot of people think about Bitcoin from a lot of the times from their sphere of where they live, their geography, their economy. But I've been around the world with you. I've met so many people and mm -hmm. I've seen so many needs and, and requirements from Bitcoin that yeah, you know, that's influenced what I think is important about Bitcoin. And I'm not sure if. If if you consider that, because a lot of people maybe focus on ETFs or you know different things or like related to where they are, but you're very fo much focused on the requirements for activists and people living under dictators, and that's a very influential and important part of Bitcoin. Well, look, there's a lot of debates in in, in the Bitcoin space, and one of them relates to you know is Bitcoin money, right? And the use cases that I've seen relate to Bitcoin's utility as money. Um, and there's more to money than store of value. And what I really wanted to do in this conversation was lay out kind of like the ultimate guide to Bitcoin use cases, because I continue to see, kind of to your point, Western journalists, people in the British press, the American press, German press, you know, writing about how is this thing alive still? You know, they're almost like exasperated. They're like, how is this? How do I still have to deal with this thing? It's so useless. It doesn't do anything. And that is so false and so detached from reality that we just need to set the record straight. This thing is so useful and so uniquely useful that it demands our attention. And, and that's kind of what I wanted to work through. And there's really four use cases for Bitcoin that we can get into. Yeah, before you get into that, yeah. so it feels like, you know, with Danny and I, you know, we're often trying to orange pill our friends and maybe our mm -hmm. friends have companies and provide that kind of content. But it feels like, therefore, this is for a specific audience or a niche of audiences. Like this is for media maybe, detractors, yeah. doubters. You're not trying, this isn't really so much for orange pilling your friends down the pub. No, but I think that, people are into Bitcoin even for different reasons, mm, yeah. right? So there might be people who are into Bitcoin um, as a personal sovereignty, you know, uh, tool, or maybe as a savings and investment uh, mechanism, or perhaps they're, they like Bitcoin mining, or perhaps they are engaged in a profession where it's useful to earn Bitcoin, or they live in a country where it's actually easier to earn Bitcoin than 
you know, whatever their local currency is. There could be a million reasons someone's sort of touching Bitcoin or adjacent to Bitcoin. They may not see sort of the fuller scope. So I would say this show is definitely for newbies and skeptics, but it's also for, you know, anyone who's involved in Bitcoin because they probably don't think about the full impact it has, you know, globally. And, you know, over the last decade or so, we've been able to see and and illuminate a lot of that. Um, it's certainly not going to be fully comprehensive, but it'll be, you know, as detailed as we can be. Okay. So you talk about four use cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know what they are. Yeah. Um, we're going to skip store of value, really. Yeah, I think we should just start with it briefly. The first use case is, is, is savings. I mean, mm -hmm. Bitcoin is an incredible savings technology. You know, that's not what this show is about because we talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the proof is in the pudding. Bitcoin is the best investment of all time since it was created to today, without question. So that's just, you know, an open and shut case. This thing's incredible savings technology. We all know it goes up and down and it's volatile but it's moving in a particular direction because it's the only digitally scarce asset in the world. And that that <clears throat> provides a foundation for the other use cases. It, it kind of makes the whole thing work, but it's not going to wow or, in, or you know interest anybody because they already know that, they should know that. Um, so we can move on from, from, you know, number one is savings and Bitcoin is the best savings technology in the world. And over time, I think people start to understand that it's the best wage technology in the world. It's the best way to preserve purchasing power over time. But that's going to really take 50, 100 year, years to fully manifest. But even over the first 15, I mean, I think it's it's just kind of shocking how how effective it's been. You can measure it in like, you know, how, many, how, how, how much Bitcoin would you need to buy an iPhone, you know, every few years? And the amount of Bitcoin you need shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. It's, it's kind of extraordinary. Um, but, you know, what I wanted to do was illuminate other use cases beyond savings. And of course, people say savings, investment, speculation, hoarding, whatever. The point is beyond just buying it and hodling, what else do you do with Bitcoin? And I wanted to break that into three things, commerce, freedom, and power. And when I say power, I mean essentially electric power. And let's take a look at what Bitcoin's doing in, in each of these areas, because basically, if you take savings, commerce, freedom, and power, that's, that's, the, that's the bedrock of civilization. So if you don't have these things, you're not going to have a very civilized society, is the reality. Like if you're not consuming a lot of energy per capita, if you don't have sound money, if you don't have certain freedoms, and you're not able to do commerce, you're living in a very poor country. And then if you look at a chart where you have per capita income on the x-axis and you have on the y-axis, you have energy per capita usage. Up in the upper right hand is the United States of America, which for all its flaws does very well for its citizenry in terms of allowing them to choose what to do with their lives, to have choice over their future, over their occupation, over what they do. If you go to the bottom left hand quadrant, which is where 4 billion people live, where they have very little energy per capita, they don't have sound money, uh, they have very little freedoms and, and they, it's very hard to do commerce. These people have very little control over their lives. We could even say they are in some way slaves, right? So I think the, the big quest for humanity is actually how do you move people from the bottom quadrant to the upper right quadrant? And what we'll kind of talk about is how Bitcoin is this kind of catalyst to get those people up there. Like this thing's going to get them sound money. It's going to get them more power and electricity. And it's going to, in turn, give them more freedoms, and it's going to allow them to, to do more commerce. And, and that's kind of the building blocks of how we advance as a civilization. And is there a chronology of importance with to these the, things? Like, I, is it energy comes first, or is it commerce that comes first? Well, I, I think what's interesting is with Bitcoin, um, it, you know, savings is widely accepted as kind of the first thing a new money will do as it monetizes. There's a great Alan Farrington essay uh, Wittgenstein's money, where he talks about, you know, well, what would it look like if something went from nothing to being the world reserve currency? Well, it would look a lot like what Bitcoin's doing today, right? Like, let's just be honest. Um, and, you know, store of value is, is usually the first use case, and people move into other things, medium of exchange, unit of account, whatever. Um, I, I think that all four of the things I'm talking about emerged quite early in Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, perhaps the energy piece of it is has been the least well understood and, mm. and kind of now finally emerging. I, I think from the very beginning, people realized it could be money for, for outcasts, right? And, and for, for rebels, right? Uh, very early, they realized, wow, this thing has, has a lot of room to grow in terms of as, as a savings technology. And I think very early on, people saw it as money that could do 
black market things, right? In terms of commerce, in terms of, you know, what was not authorized you could do with Bitcoin because it was unstoppable. So maybe, maybe the first few uh, came on first uh, and, and we're just starting to see the emergence of, of, of what it's going to do for the world in terms of power and electricity. Um, but yeah, but I mean, we can just start with commerce. I mean, what I wanted to do for the show is give people a little mantra to take away for each of the three areas. So the mantra for commerce is going to be, we have financial privilege. And this is something that um, I credit actually Alan, again, Farrington for, for, I think he's the first person I've ever seen mention this in an essay he wrote many years ago, um, this idea of financial privilege. And it was kind of a tongue in cheek thing, right? Because we talk about privilege, we need to check our privilege. But, you know, we need to check our financial privilege is, is the reality. Like, you know, in the West, we are so comfortable with having a currency that is accepted everywhere. When, you know, when you, Pete, travel to another country, oftentimes you don't even have to exchange the money that's in your wallet. Um, you can just spend it in another country. Uh, no one's going to question your credit card. You know, it's pretty easy for you to buy something abroad. Um, you know, it's pretty easy for even middle class people in Western countries to access things uh, like insurance and uh, investing in stocks and bonds and having a, like a retirement portfolio of different financial instruments. These are things that even like, even lower middle class people have access to pension plans. Like this is, this is, this financialization is, is pretty widely available in, in, in advanced economies, right? Well, there was, there's even more than that though, that became obvious when we were traveling through Africa, we have a social safety net. That's a financial privilege. We have Universal healthcare in the UK, a financial. We have so many yeah. others. And and but remember what the, the the point that the the fiat world tells you is that it's okay that dot the dollar or the pound is devaluing over time because you can just invest in the stock market. That's what they say. They yeah. basically say, look, yes, we know that fiat money's bad at long term savings. We admit it. But it doesn't matter because you could just go to put your money in the stock market. And that is a privilege, right? The people that you and I saw in Malawi, you know, if we use that kind of moment in time as a reference, they can invest in the stock market. The way they invest is, you know, it's actually sheet metal, cattle, or really, really bad paper notes of, of in that case, quacha currency, right? So they can't invest in the stock market. So let's just remember, there's about a billion people in the world who have the benefit of being born into a reserve currency, meaning a fiat that is so valuable that other central banks that are rivals will invest in it. And that's the dollar, the euro, the pound, uh, the yen, the, the RMB, and, and you know maybe in a small way, the Swiss and, and Australian and Canadian currencies. That's about it. So it's about a billion people um, who live in both uh, a, having a reserve currency that they're born into no one chooses their currency, right? In terms of fiat, right? Um, and rule of law and, and and free speech, right? Because there are some countries that have reserve currencies that are dictatorships, right? So if you want the full fruits of property rights, you know, let's say protection against confiscation from the government, uh, protection against frozen bank accounts, um, and you want a strong currency, you know, there's, there's what is known as the golden billion who basically have that. And then the other 7 billion people in the world live either under an authoritarian regime where there's no property rights really, um, where they can just censor and confiscate, or they live under a, a government that has a very weak fiat currency. So, you know, we need to check our financial privilege is the point. We have this financial privilege and we need to understand that money does not work for most people on earth. For the overwhelming majority of people on earth, money is a problem. It's not a, it's not a positive thing in their lives. It's a pain. It's hard to move money to their family. It's hard to find something that keeps their purchasing power. It's, it's very difficult to transact abroad. Um, all the things that are second nature to us maybe in Britain or Germany or the United States are, are big challenges for other people. And you know, some people listening who live in those countries in the West, they may know this because they might have family in those countries. But if you don't, and you're just kind of hanging out in London or New York, and you live in a little bubble and that's where you live your life, which is totally fine and great, you need to understand that the way that you interact with money is very unique. You are very, very privileged. Um, and that manifests in a lot of different ways. I mean, we see, um, you know, currency debasement is not really something that, that Western people have really had to deal with recently. You know, it's never a situation where people in LA or uh, in London wake up and, oh, your, your currency's worth half as much as it was yesterday. 
that's just not something that modern Western folks have had to deal with. Yet. But people, yet, yes, certainly, <laughs> we'll get to that. But but no, but it happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, we, we were in Malawi where people had undergone a 44% currency devaluation, which is just shocking to think about. And it was a surprise overnight thing where no one got a warning. Um, but even putting little Malawi aside, the two largest countries in A, the Arab world, and B, Africa, meaning Egypt and Nigeria, with, with a total combined population of more than 300 million people, um, uh, have been subject to, the people who live in these countries have been subject to massive currency devaluation over the past year, where they've lost about that much as well. Uh, close to half of all their purchasing power has been vaporized. Um, and they have very, it's hard for them to get out in the traditional sense. Like using the legacy system, it's very hard for them to get out. Gold is just very hard to find in some cases. In some countries, it's illegal. Like in Egypt, there's huge controls on it. US dollars are illegal in many of these countries. Like in Ethiopia, for example, where there's massive inflation, having a dollar on the street outside the capital is illegal. You can go to prison for it. I know a guy whose brother got arrested for it. So they try to close the off ramps, right? They want to keep you in this fiat currency and squeeze it so that they can squeeze your time and get stuff for cheaper. That's the whole point of some of the previous shows I've done with you guys. That's how the international financial system works in terms of you know the dollar empire squeezing all these other countries. So they try to close all the exits. And and that is that is something that people have had to deal with. And if you were in the 1980s or 90s and you were being structurally adjusted and you were, your currency was being devalued, you had really no way out. I mean, it really sucked. I mean, what ended up happening is is you died a little earlier, basically. I mean, you, you, you're, the, the life expectancy in these countries went down, which is crazy when you think about, oh, we're like advancing and we're you know improving our technology and sanitation and medicine. And you know to see the, 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 per cap, the real per capita income and life expectancy and child mortality rates of these countries go down, it was pretty crazy. So, so that's what people have had to deal with. And I think it's important that we recognize that. And, and, and you're seeing Bitcoin as a use case grow out of this, out of these broken monetary systems. Of course, yes, as a hedge against inflation, but more so just as a way to move value. Like, let's take the case of Nigeria, for example. M like many countries in the world, uh, another thing that people in the West don't have to deal with, they have something called dual dual currencies, dual dual rates of exchange. There's the official rate, and then there's the the the, the street rate. <clears throat> and you guys have dealt with this in Argentina and many other places, right? This is a normal thing that people on Earth have to deal with every day. Of course, in the West, we don't really have this. But let's say you want to wire a hundred bucks to Nigeria and you want to use Western Union uh, and you live in Atlanta or, you know, you, you know, you, you live in Brussels and you're trying to get money in, into Nigeria. Well, um, what's going to happen is Western Union is going to work with the legacy financial system and it's going to use the official rate of exchange, which let's just say for the purposes of our chat is roughly about a thousand Naira per dollar. Okay. So the, your family on the other end is going to get a thousand Naira per dollar and then there's going to be a big fee and, you know, who knows in the end, they'll, they'll, they'll probably get, you know, whatever, 700 Naira per dollar or something like that. Um, what's crazy is that the real rate of exchange is 2000 Naira per dollar. So if you use Bitcoin instead of Western Union, your family or your counterparty is getting twice as much value. Okay. So here we have the first like point I want to make, and there'll be many more in this show where like someone just needs to write this down. This is impossible to do with the legacy financial system. Just write this down. Okay, first one, wire money at a real rate of exchange to a country with two currency systems. And this is something that like hundreds of millions of people deal with all the time. If you don't want half your value stolen from you, you should use Bitcoin, right? Now, I understand stable coins do a similar job, um, but you know, as we can talk about, there's a lot more instability with stable coins and they're centralized, they could be blacklisted. If you want pure sovereignty over your decision to send value to somebody else in Nigeria and, and you want the real rate of exchange, you use Bitcoin. And what's amazing is minutes later, your counterparty has, has BTC and then they can go out and use a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, which is super easy to do in Nigeria. And if they want to, they can swap it for cash and they're gonna get very close to 2000 Naira uh, for every dollar. But if they use Western Union, you're getting 700. So you can't tell me Bitcoin doesn't have a use case. That is an insanely useful use case. It is something that the current legacy system cannot do, cannot do. It, it fails, right? So that's one really important example. Another one I wanted to point out um, from like a, let's say, humanitarian kind of financial inclusion, um, you know, financial privilege point of view is, is Afghanistan, because this is, this is quite important. So if you want to fund education for girls in Afghanistan today, 
So girls in Afghanistan haven't been able to go to school for more than 800 days since 2021 when the Taliban took over Kabul and most of the country. And uh, you're a brave entrepreneur like our friend Roy Mahboub, let's say. And you want to you want to continue to finance uh, literacy of women and training for young women in that country. You cannot use the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is technically, physically in incapable of getting into Afghanistan to do this. You can't use it. Um, with Bitcoin, you can. This is how she funds it. Can I ask you a question yeah, that's totally off on a tangent? Yeah. What kind of risk are they putting themselves in by funding this? Well, so I think it's a great question. People ask us a lot of our, of our work with Bitcoin. Aren't you endangering people? And it's a great, it's similar to the work we've done in North Korea with outside information. And we, you know, we make, a, 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 you know, we weigh that. And in our mind, the answer is spread freedom technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the answer is let them decide. Look, if they are in North Korea and they pick up something that's been dropped from a balloon or brought in by a, a smuggler and they see it or they have an opportunity to buy it, they don't have to buy it. Mm -hmm. That's their choice. You know, let's let them decide, right, rather than not have an option at all. So for these girls in Afghanistan and their teachers and their families, they get to decide. It's not in, This is not an imposition. Of course. This is an option. Um, and you know, I would take the risk all day to make sure that they have the opportunity to, to be educated and to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so far, so good um, in terms of the students. Um, some teachers have been arrested, but you know, I, I would let Roya speak for them, but my sense is from talking to her that they were, that that was worth the sacrifice for them. Yeah. But you know, I think you'd have to talk to the educators themselves. The point is they they, they can't use the dollar to educate people in Afghanistan today, and they can use Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, again, write this under your use cases. Current, you know, money today can't do this. This other kind of money can, right? So again, Bitcoin is money. It does things that other money can't do. And this is one of those. It has nothing to do with store of value, really. I mean, it's peripherally connected. But the idea that this thing can bypass these like corrupt currency uh, you know, dual systems and fake rates, and and it can it can bypass controls um, in this way is is actually pretty remarkable. This it might be a bit more complicated yeah. than say Nigeria, but if you have a Bitcoin transfer to you, you can go to a money dealer and transfer it locally. Mm -hmm. uh, how if a, if a female teacher is being paid in Afghanistan? How mm -hmm. much access do they have to liquidity? I don't even know what the local currency in is in Afghanistan, but to actually turn that into a useful currency. Yeah, so basically the um, Hawala system is a half trillion dollar a year global marketplace of informal currency exchange, mainly in the Muslim world, right? Where people from different countries use a broker network to, to send and receive value. So those brokers sit in physical markets. And until pretty recently, even under the Taliban, um, you know, you would just go to the market <laughs> like like you do in little Tehran in, in Toronto or whatever. And there's a bunch of money changers and the money changers would take your Bitcoin and, and give you cash. Now those have been cracked down upon because the, you know, the Taliban don't like things that they can't control. So, you know, I understand there could be this connection between Islam and, and, and Bitcoin. And I think there is. But the Taliban are, are a dictatorship, right? And they don't they don't love the idea of money they can't control. So they kind of tr tried to go in and quote unquote clean up that that. So it's a little harder today. But you know, from what Roya and others tell me, it's it's trivial to exchange Bitcoin for for paper currency in in, in Kabul today. If you know, you just have to know the right person. Do they, do they, does Afghanistan have its own currency? Yes, it has its okay. own currency, and in fact, um, it's been demonetized several times because the first time the Taliban took over in the 90s, they deemed the previous currency not Islamic enough. So they got rid of it and brought in their own. And it's been such a mess for people who live there, really. Um, so the idea that they can have Bitcoin now is 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 is, is, is pretty special. But, you know, th those are um, sort of a couple examples uh, of, of, the, of, of how broken money is. And of course, you guys have had guests on who've talked about even personally experiences dealing with things like hyperinflation, things like that. Um, you know, in Venezuela, uh, you know, the wealthy were always able to sort of get out of that sort of thing, right? They would literally, during hyperinflation in Venezuela, they would take out a loan from a bank in Bolivars and then go buy an apartment in Miami Beach. And they would watch the value of the Bolivar loan go to zero. 
So the wealthy and the, and the elite have always had, they've always sort of been able to get out of these situations, even in places like Egypt today or Nigeria, they, they can find a way to find some other instrument. But the lower middle classes have always been screwed, right, until today, right? So this finally gives everybody the opportunity, even, you know, in ta Taliban ruled Afghanistan, um, or, you know, uh, communities collapsing in conflict, like Yemen, Syria, I mean, anyone can, can get access to this thing. And, and that's such a great equalizer, right? So there's this saying that Bitcoin maybe is not for everyone, but it's for anyone. And I think that that's, that's very important. The, the last um, use case in this, in this category before we move on would be, would be to go back to Southern Africa, a reminder that you don't need the internet to use Bitcoin. So while we were in Malawi, you know, we're not too far from where Machankura was invented by uh, a guy named KG who grew up in a township in apartheid in South Africa. And now he's created a way for people without the internet to use Bitcoin. It's absolutely remarkable. But basically <clears throat> the idea is that, you know, even the financial privilege piece even extends to the Bitcoin community. Like Bitcoiners don't think about how do we allow people who don't have the internet to use Bitcoin if they're based in you know, whatever, Portugal or, or the UK or the US, because they have internet here. Like, we're not worried about that. But Bitcoin is for anyone. If Bitcoin's going to be for anyone, it's got to actually be for anyone, right? And um, what's awesome to see is the innovation happening in places that, that have less infrastructure, right? So KG was very familiar with, with both power outages and lack of a good currency, and most importantly, lack of, lack of internet. So he kind of hacked together this way for people to, to use a mobile phone network. So they use this USSD protocol and they basically, you send an SMS message on a feature phone, which has no internet or a smartphone with no data. And you just text a number and it gives you a little decision tree right on one of these old school phones. And you know, you can choose um, buy, sell, uh, you can redeem vouchers. So if you have South African Rand in cash, you could go to like a brick and mortar store in South Africa and you can use Azteco to top up your Bitcoin account on Manchankura with cash. No ID needed, right? You don't need a bank account to do this. So you can have full access to the global economy. Bit refills built into the app. So you can pay your electricity bill in South Africa with Bitcoin. So you can do all this stuff with Bitcoin without even touching the financial system. So this is just a little bit of an insight into what's happening. Um, people are getting out of truly broken situations uh, when it comes from an economic point of view, uh, using Bitcoin. So, I mean, the use case, and what I just described is not possible with the US dollar. Again, like you can't do that. Someone without the internet in a township in South Africa cannot use the US dollar to transact abroad. That's just not gonna happen. They can't even get one. And even if you can get one momentarily in this era where we have these stable type coins, that's not gonna be forever. You know, let's remember those things exist at the pleasure of the US government. Um, but this, this is the revolution, right? So mentioned a couple things, please write them down. You can't do these things with the dollar or Euro. Uh, they, they matter tremendously to hundreds of millions or if not billions of people, you can do them with Bitcoin. So that's like the commerce piece, right? Amazing, I'm just, I'm just like sitting here, just like in awe consuming this, there's like, and we could stop there, but we're not because there's two other, if not equally, maybe even more important areas. And that's freedom and power. Um, so freedom. So the mantra for freedom is going to be Bitcoin is bad for dictators. Very simple. Bitcoin is really bad for dictators. I li really like the framing here where, I mean, you're going to explain mm -hmm. it, but where what dictators want and what mm -hmm. uh, civilized countries have, like free countries, democratic countries have, and how Bitcoin is horrible for dictators. Funny enough, though, just as a question before we get into that, I'm pretty sure they're dictators that use Bitcoin themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like anything, we have short and long-term time horizons, right? Um, you can think of, and there's also asymmetric technology, right? So maybe you can argue that the internet was, was good in certain ways for, you know, helping states control people. But it's very hard to argue that the fact that people have all the knowledge in the world in their pockets as the as not pointing to some sort of human empowerment. You know, it's hard to argue again that you having essentially the Library of Alexandria in your pocket is not empowering for people. But yeah. but I understand you know how people are talking about how the internet has 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 given control, and I, I guess you could say the same thing about encryption, right? But surely it's been a net positive. I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And and look at encryption. Yes, of course, Vladimir Putin can you know trade secrets with his daughter, mm. but that's not 
the full picture. The full yeah. picture is that tens of millions of Russians can communicate without him knowing what they're saying. Yeah. So things like the internet, encryption, and, and Bitcoin are going to be huge wins for the individual. Uh, there can be short-term things that governments can do. Mm -hmm. But you have to understand, it, you know, if there's some rogue regime right now that's like using Bitcoin, and honestly, the evidence we have of this is pretty freaking thin. I mean, we would know more by now. We can speculate about mining in, in Russia, and we can speculate about, you know, usage by different regimes. But the reality is that the Chinese Communist Party banned Bitcoin mining several years ago mm -hmm. because they thought it was not harmonious and pure. The reality is last summer, Vladimir Putin passed a law banning citizens from using Bitcoin for payments in Russia. So, you know, I think that it's possible they'll try to have their cake and eat it too and kind of use Bitcoin maybe at the geopolitical level, but prevent their citizens from using it. But they, they are going to go all out against non-KYC self-custodial Bitcoin use. This is terrible for them. I mean, maybe you can argue like ETFs and stuff like that could, could help them. But if you were talking about roots, grassroots usage of Bitcoin, peer-to-peer, non-KYC, self-custodial, this is a disaster for Bitcoin, for, for dictators, because it, it it empowers people who oppose them. But it, on an international, mm -hmm. on the international um, uh, scale, it, yes. it kind of closes the walls around them a bit more as everyone else starts using Bitcoin they become more isolated from the international community. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like Cuba. Cuba tried for the longest time to prevent its citizens from having the internet. And when I first started at my organization at the Human Rights Foundation in 2007, we were actually smuggling outside information into Cuban underground libraries. People didn't have the internet, so they were watching like dubbed versions of V for Vendetta and stuff like that. It was awesome um, in terms of giving them a little bit of the outside world. Now, of course, they have more internet because the government was forced to make a decision. Do we impoverish the island forever and become like North Korea, or do we do we open up and 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 try to survive a different way? So I think the same will ultimately be true for Bitcoin. Like it'll ultimately be impossible to 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 keep Bitcoin out of a country. So the governments are going to have to just figure out a way to deal with it. Um, but ultimately, you just have to think long term. I, and I and I appreciate bringing up like, well, don't 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 bad guys use use Bitcoin. But let's think about this. Like, let's say you're China or um, Saudi Arabia or Russia, right? Let's say you're the dictator of one of these countries. What do you need to survive? You need censorship, confiscation, and closed capital markets. You, you cannot survive without these three things. Now, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is free speech, property rights, and open capital markets. It's fundamentally opposed to the DNA of dictatorship. Now, it doesn't mean that there won't be autocrats in a Bitcoin standard, but it'll be a lot harder to do so because people will have the power to, to push back and to be financially free. And that's gonna be very devastating for them. And here's the good news for Democrats, people who believe in democracy properly understood, meaning you know, a government that is sort of accountable to the people, is that you know, if you think about America, at least, the good part of America, the, the founding spirit of America, which is, which is tremendous, is, is we are all about free speech, private property, and open capital markets. So you know, long-term, when I say Bitcoin is bad for, for dictators, look, it's good for democracies. It's good for free and open societies because it actually delivers more power to the people. And I think it'll get rid of our worst impulses in democracies in terms of invisible spending on wars abroad and all this nonsense we fund and all this opacity at the state level and all these hidden taxes and all this inflation and you know the military industrial complex and all this corruption. Like A lot of this stuff is because the money can be manipulated, right? If we're all on an equal playing ground, we're all using an open neutral currency, a lot of this stuff is just not going to be possible. Um, but I, but I, but I think we will be, we will, we will adapt and we will get stronger for it. Like, I'm really excited about America in a Bitcoin standard. I think America is going to do really well. China is going to probably collapse. I don't think there's any way the CCP can survive a Bitcoin standard. I just, it's just fundamentally opposed. So people can, can complain, you know, now, um, but in the future, this thing's going to be tremendous for freedom. And it's ultimately, it just doesn't work with dictatorship. If you have money that the people control, that the government cannot debase, that the government cannot censor, and the government cannot confiscate, that does not work for you. That's not going to that's not going to work for you. And yet, this thing is just continuing to spread. So, just to look at some like specific examples for people, right? Because there's more about use cases rather than theory. Um, let's just look at it today. You know, the foundation that Alexei Navalny, rest in peace, um, created, runs its entire payroll on Bitcoin. It would be impossible for this foundation to run its payroll on the US dollar or the euro or the Russian ruble because fiat currency doesn't work for them anymore. They need a global supranational currency that is unstoppable, 
that affords people to use it without having to pair their ID with their transactions. That is the only way that they can continue to get donations and continue to pay people in different parts of the world. That is not um, a, there is no fiat monetary solution that does that, but they use it and it's good, it's, it's dissident money. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, there are countless examples of other protest groups and movements, whether they be the democracy movement in Belarus, which, which we talked about on the show before, Palestinians, I mean, trying to reach Palestinians in Gaza today, I mean, completely impossible with the dollar essentially, but the UNWRA, which, which is of course the UN uh, organization that was set up after the partition and the creation of Israel to protect all the refugee Palestinians that were created by, by the creation of Israel, um, uh, they uh, started accepting Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, and they use it. And the director, and the American director of the UNWRA posted publicly uh, a couple months ago that this is the, the only way he can really get value in, into the country. Um, so whether it be Belarus, whether it be Palestine, whether it be Ukraine, I mean, look what happened in Ukraine when Putin attacked. I mean, everything went down and you were able to donate with Bitcoin, stable coins, you know, these kind of assets, right? Um, let's think about Nigeria. You know, they had a huge protest movement break out against police violence a couple of years ago. And Jack Dorsey famously supported an initiative run by uh, what was known as the Feminist Coalition. And they turned to Bitcoin because it couldn't be stopped and it powered their protest. Um, in Hong Kong, there's a quiet revolution of Hong Kongers who use Bitcoin to get money in and out of the country. There's still a network of Bitcoin ATMs in Hong Kong that don't require ID up to a certain amount. So it's very easy and you know very, very trivial for, for me from America. I can just send a Bitcoin payment to a Hong Kong activist and they can just convert it into Hong Kong dollars you know, moments later uh, with no ID up to a certain amount. So, I mean, you know, and you're increasingly seeing the fabric of human rights groups start to integrate Bitcoin. And, and I'm working at this every day. And I think it's very important because I want activist groups to be as strong as possible in their journey. I want them to understand digital security. I want them to understand how to fundraise, how to, how to market themselves correctly, how to connect, how to tell their story. These are all things we work on at HRF, but critically financial security is a big part of that. And we are, we've been making grants in Bitcoin to other human rights groups for a while now. And you know, ultimately it comes down to, you know, again, when you're look, looking at your little scorecard of Bitcoin versus fiat in terms of use cases. I mean, when, I, when, I, when we make a grant to somebody in Gabon or something like that, and we say, okay, do you want this, whatever it is, 25,000 euros, do you want it in euros as a bank wire or do you want Bitcoin? Increasingly, the answer is Bitcoin. They want Bitcoin because they can have it moments later. I mean, look, we're a 501c3 organization, right? So these folks fill out the same paperwork regardless of what kind of money we send them, right? Doesn't matter to, to us in terms of that, but our accounting team loves it when it's a Bitcoin transaction. It's so much easier to deal with. I mean, a bank wire is the most dinosaur technology of all time. It's so absurd and it can get frozen and it's known immediately to the local government, which is the most important part. So the activist group in Egypt or Gabon or whatever, they don't want the dictator to know that they got $25,000 from the Human Rights Foundation. No, it might be totally fine for the US government to know that. And they have to know that because we'll report that. But it's so critical that the local government doesn't know. And if we send a bank wire, they know right away and that those people can go to prison. So you talk about the risks that we take when we fund activism. It is so much safer to send Bitcoin than it is to send fiat. So much safer. I mean, I've got colleagues who used to have to sew dollars into their clothing and go into and, and, and put it into suitcases and try to smuggle physically money into these regimes, whether it be Belarus or Bolivia, um, you know, and hope that they don't get caught. And they don't have to do that anymore. They can just send Bitcoin, you know. So, so the safety it's brought to funding and human rights activism is totally uh, unparalleled. I mean, I don't think we've seen, you know, a revolution like this uh, yet. So, you know, we're working on that. Um, and, you know, I just think, again, you have to think long-term. We can talk about all these use cases and there's so many of them around the world of, of activist groups fundraising in Bitcoin, using Bitcoin. Um, you know, HRF has a great product now, a financial freedom newsletter, which I will definitely shill mm. called the Financial Freedom Report comes out every Thursday morning. You can sign up at uh, hrf.org slash financial freedom report. And we put a lot of work into it. I mean, we put a lot of work into it. And every week it covers like five or six global areas or issues, or breaking news about like monetary news, which you don't find anywhere else, like inflation in this country, devaluation in this country, new currency in this country. And then we feature a bunch of stuff on Bitcoin tools and software development. And, you know, as I'm editing this and reading this every week, I'm just blown away about, you know, the number of countries where Bitcoin is rising in adoption, the number of people using Bitcoin, um, and, and, and the number of 
you know, places where this is becoming so important. I mean, it, I was editing it today. It comes out later this week. Um, Orban in Hungary is creating a new task force uh, to go after and freeze the bank accounts of anybody who disagrees with him. Literally, a task force. So again, you know, your your little euros and dollars aren't going to be of any help to dissident academics and you know intellectuals in Hungary because he will freeze it if if you send them value, right? Whereas if you use Bitcoin, they're good to go. So again, this is just you know this is money that is bad for dictators and it works for everybody. And there's just so many use cases of it being powerful freedom tech. And ultimately, you know, that's my bread and butter. That's why I got interested. Later on, only did I learn about the savings aspect, the commerce aspect, and then what we're going to get to sort of here at the end, the power aspect. But yeah. man, this thing's just freedom money. Yeah, I'm, I, just, let's just go straight into it. I, yeah. I have no questions. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just sat here just taking it all in. Yeah, well, the list so far, if you're taking notes at home, I mean, hopefully it's long now. I mean, we've got tons of specific use cases. I mean, the idea of uh, doing this show and 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 hopefully I'll I, I I kind of have turned this into a talk, which I hope to give at, at, at you know events near you soon. Um, but essentially, is just is just overwhelming the skeptic with just an endless array of use cases, which are all observable and only. A tip of the iceberg. You know what I can say here in whatever it is, sixty to ninety minutes, is is just the tip of the iceberg. But you know, it is profoundly changing our ability uh, for people to have sovereignty when it comes to these four areas of, of savings, of commerce, of freedom, and power. Um, so, okay, so we'll go to the last one, um, which is for me the one that was you know most distant for me personally, and you know most difficult for me to understand. It took me the longest time. And that's power. And when I say power, I mean electric power. And the mantra for this one is going to be um, not Bitcoin mining wastes energy. And and this is this is really important because if you listen to what the media has told us in the West and what governments have told us in the West over the last 10 years, 15 years, it's that basically A, um, and, and we can go. We can go through each of the the, the sort of um, the, the areas we've been discussing. They've been saying, "A, it's it's uh, it's too risky." Well, from a savings point of view, it's been the best performing asset of all time. So that was a lie. Um, B, you know, they've said that it's it's a speculative instrument and and it has no utility. Well, in the commerce section, we've covered how this can be this super powerful money for people who are on the you know edges of the financial system. Uh, and then they said it's money for bad people, right? No, it's money for freedom fighters. Sure, some bad people will use it, but overwhelmingly, this is money that provides people freedom. And the final lie they trot out is that it's it's a waste of energy or that it's bad for the environment. And and here's where we can start to 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 you know dismantle these arguments. Um, I've known for a long time that that Bitcoin mining was going to help bootstrap renewable energy. I, I wrote about this three years ago. It went into a book I, I published three years ago. Um, I interviewed miners back then. I, I I read Ross Stevens' amazing 2020 uh, letter to his shareholders at Stone Ridge, and that 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 helped helped inspire me and a lot of other people. Actually, I mean that that document was so foundational. Um, and of course, of course, there's a lot of awesome chatter back in Bitcoin Talk forums going back way back to, to suggest this. But it's been amazing. It's been really really powerful to go from concept and like, hey, this should work to seeing it work, I mean, was was just so powerful for me. So yes, I knew that Bitcoin mining was going to bootstrap renewables, um, but I didn't really get what it was going to do for the world until until I went and you guys were with me. We, 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 you know, I got to visit numerous, um, you know, mining sites where they're doing off-grid mining in, in East Africa, South Africa. And um, I, I think that the best way to tell it to the listeners to revisit a moment I had in uh, Kenya on the shore of this lake called Lake uh, Navisha, I think it was called. And you're sitting there and you're looking at a, um, a water pump. And it's a very ubiquitous scene in Kenya. Kenya is the world's largest exporter of flowers, right? So they pump a lot of water, right? So you're, you'll be in rural Kenya and there's tons of like remote small operations where in Kenya, it's typically geothermal or hydropower, right? Being brought down to a lake shore where you have this beautifully clean, consistent base load power. That's the same for the next 40 years, right? In our case, it was, in my case, I was looking at a geothermal powered water pump. And so you've got the same amount of electricity, you know, coming in every day, every hour. 
And the water pump is a variable demand consumer of electricity. They don't have a grid in this area. There's no one to buy the excess electricity, right? And that's how it is all across Kenya and all across Africa and in so many places in Latin America and Asia and the Middle East and elsewhere too. Um, even in the West, they're, they're, you know, what you start to realize is that every single power generation station wastes power. Um, whenever you, you know, drive past a wind farm and, and some of them aren't running, um, it, it could be because like in California today, you might have negative pricing during the day. You might have no one to buy the power. You might have too much power. Um, <clears throat> and that is, that is certainly the case in Africa, uh, where they don't really have an, a continental grid at all to speak of. Um, so you're sitting there and you're watching this little water pump go and do its thing. And then you're, then, and, and this is a problem, right? I mean, it's, it's wasting valuable, valuable energy that could be used to do other things. And then you turn to your left and you see a little hut with a Starlink on it. And this is the Bitcoin network buying 100% of the electricity that the water pump can't buy. Okay. So the water pump is buying a certain amount to do its job and it leaves a bunch on the table. And the, now at that site, the Bitcoin network is buying the rest. So there's no more wasted energy. So in this case, this is why not Bitcoin mining wastes energy, right? And you think about the, the impact that's going to have on, on just commercial activity, profit activity in Africa. I mean, that's going to make all of these renewable sites to bring electricity into places that don't have it profitable. Like it will just, it is just immediately profitable within a few years to set up one of these sites anywhere. Um, now, it, 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 you know, maybe you're not going to make money in your first year, but after two or three years, you're going to be making money. And that's, that is light years better than the situation before, which was that essentially all of this power infrastructure in Africa was done with concessional financing. It was basically all just donated because someone felt like it. The Scottish government donated the one we saw in Malawi. Great. Are we going to, so people basically have to wait around for someone to feel good and feel like they want to make a difference in the world to have power. I mean, that's insane. So Bitcoin fixes this and it makes it profitable now for someone to create uh, you know, electricity infrastructure in these places. And, you know, the gridless folks think that Malawi, a country where today only 11% of the population has power, which is crazy to think about. And, and even the 11% that do have power suffer from six to eight hours of load shedding a day on the national grid, right? Meaning they have a blackout that's like massive. So every day, and we, 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 this, we, we dealt with this in Kenya too. We were at dinner and the power just went out. And this is normal in that part of the world. We don't necessarily deal with that, you know, in the West, but that's like normal for most people. So you think about the fact that Gridless thinks that within 30 years, nearly 100% of people in Malawi will, Malawi will have access to electricity because of Bitcoin mining. I mean, man, that's that incredible. is a use case. That is a civilizational use case. And no, the petrodollar cannot do that. You know, the British pound cannot do that. The euro cannot do that. These are these monies cannot do that. There is nothing about the dollar that allows it to go into rural Malawi or Kenya and bootstrap electricity so that people can reach a higher level of civilization. It's not 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 happening. Was it you who said that you had that moment when we were in Malawi where you incredible. saw the light up on the hill? When we were having oh, dinner in we the We were field. dinner, yeah. yeah. And the was, guy's like, hey, watch this. It was dark everywhere. Yeah. And then there was just these little speckles of light in the foothills. <laughs> and it's all because of Bitcoin mining. And that town is like, they do not have money. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, to, to visit that site, that was a hydro site. So it's very different, but similar in as much as every day, the river creates a particular amount of energy and you know the village only consumes a certain amount and obviously at night they consume way less yep. because there's no other like big industrial buyers of energy there it's just the town and like some agricultural stuff there's nothing happening at night mm -hmm. so the amount of energy wasted at night is so massive relatively relatively and then they might have a storm and have tons more now it's very different for them and th that was different from the, the kenyan example is just a pure business right that was a social enterprise in Malawi, but I think- the, Do you the, mean that because the Scottish government funded the original grid there? I, I mean that the entire infrastructure was donated and B, the current power that the villagers of Bondo, Malawi are buying is subsidized by Mega, mm. by the philanthropists that we met down there. Yeah. So, so pre-Bitcoin, he was bringing their cost down from like 70, 80, 90 cents a kilowatt hour to around 20 cents, which is still twice as much as what people pay generally in the United States. But still it was like, he, he was, that was just, he was eating that. That was like his contribution. Now that now that the Bitcoin network buys 100% of what um, the river sells, or the river generates, he doesn't have to do that anymore, right? So Bitcoin subsidizes that power, brings the costs down, gives him capital. Now Mega, the company he runs is able to 
Um, and we were there when they were starting to plan, like, well, what do we do with all this new capital? Well, they're going to they're gonna connect more homes, right? They're going to bring on more power. And it's very counterintuitive, I understand this, when people are like, how is that possible? How could Bitcoin, which requires energy, bring more energy you know, to a place? But that's what happens because it gives capital to the company and now they can connect more consumers and they are even talking about expanding to build more microgrids so that they can have more people come. You can't do this with fiat currency. This is a, this is a proof of work, Bitcoin only use case that's going to change the world. But it, it had a compound effect on the other thing you were talking about, which is commerce, in that we went to the village. And we, freedom. Yeah, and freedom. We met the chief and he was telling us like his wife, now she can make food and she can refrigerate it. The kids. And, yeah, the kids, you know, and so it just has this compound effect yeah. upon I mean, the everything. Kids, the, 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 ent- the acceptance rate into the top schools for the kids in this region has skyrocketed ever since they've, they've had access to power. And this thing's just going to bring more and more power. And, you know, what's what's kind of amazing is that all of the things we've talked about so far relate to power. Like with, without power, you have no freedom. And without power, you have no commerce. And without power, you have really no savings. Um, so, the, the, you know, you have no ability to save for the future if you have no power, I mean, in, in a real way. So these things are all sort of really connected. And, and these civilizational building blocks that Bitcoin provides for people is, is quite radical. The, the last thing I'll say about the power part is the externality, right? So important to note, every Bitcoin miner is a space heater. As Troy Cross will say, you know, you know, no energy is actually like deleted. It just gets transformed into something else as it passes through the Bitcoin miner, right? Um, so it passes through in the form of heat. So when we were down in Malawi or in Kenya and we were at one of these Bitcoin mining sites, if you put your hand up where the exhaust was, it was searing hot, right? And <clears throat> this is something that that is going to take the world time to sort of collectively figure out, well, what do we do with the heat? Um, but in, in, in Africa, for example, their plan in Bondo was we, they were growing pineapples there. They're either going to dry pineapple and sell it, which is a great use of the externality, or we were on a tea plantation, you know, and I learned that like, well, how do you process tea? Within a certain number of hours, once you harvest tea from these bushes, you have to bring it to one of these um, facilities they have there. All it is, is it dries, it basically dries it, it cures the tea, it dries it. So, you know, you could be drying the tea with a machine that takes electricity and makes heat and doesn't make Bitcoin, or you could be drying the tea with a machine that creates heat and makes Bitcoin. Like, what are you going to choose? Like, and, you know, people just don't know this yet, but once they know it, they're obviously going to choose the machine that mines the Bitcoin. And the example would be about a thousand miles north in the Congo, where they've been mining Bitcoin for a little while. So they're ahead of the curve here in Virunga National Park. Um, They are now using Bitcoin mining to dry cocoa. So they had a choice at the park where in this, the middle of this incredible ecosystem where they're, they, they, these folks are, you know, really relying on Bitcoin as the stream of income. It's been super helpful for, to preserve the people around who live in the, the million, five million people who live around the park and all the animals, the gorillas, incredible life that lives there. Um, over, the, over since 2020, the last four years, Bitcoin mining has been an incredible stream of income for them. And, and, you know, they had these basically hydro facilities that, that, weren't we're using a tiny amount of, of their capacity and now bitcoin buys all of it and it's been giving them this 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 income stream is so important so now they're thinking about well <clears throat> we produce cocoa here and there's like images of it you just like they just put it on the ground and the, the sun dries it over time and it's not that effective and it's not even considered sanitary so certain countries in the eu won't even like buy it because they don't they're not they don't trust like the sanitation around it so they're like all right we can either spend $200,000 buying an industrial heater or we can spend $200,000 buying asics so now that they know like the average person would be like i don't know what an asic is right but now that they've been taught about bitcoin and they've lived with bitcoin for a little while they're like obviously we're going to buy the asics so now they have all these asics set up in a way where they're piping the heat and it's blasting into these crates and it's drying the cocoa. And at the Oslo Freedom Forum, which which you'll come to in a few months, um, Peter, and in Norway, in June three to five, we're going to be having the chocolate there that was made by Bitcoin mining. And, and that's just a really neat externality. Like it's basically, you have to think about it this way. If you're Bitcoin mining out there in the world somewhere, your like profit won't just be you know, your, your, your revenue minus your cost of mining, it'll be your revenue minus your cost of mining, plus the profit you make from the externality. And that's really interesting because it'll allow Bitcoin mining to reach places where, where, you know, where it might not even be able to reach today. Like once people 
physic, you know, start to understand harnessing that reality. And whether it be a bathhouse in Brooklyn, like that this mm-hmm. incredible reason documentary about this guy who I've met who, you know, he's like, he's realized that he spends less money heating his spa today with by heating the water with Bitcoin miners than he did with a traditional industrial heater. And it's like some physics guy, and I did a Q&A, live Q&A, and some physics guy in the audience explained like why, because of the way that Bitcoin miners run in this constant cycle, it, it actually is quite really good for heating. But it was amazing for us to learn from him that he actually spends less money today heating his spa with miners instead of with big machines, and he makes Bitcoin, right? He earns money. So, the, the, and, and to put the cherry on top of all of it, when you're mining Bitcoin and you're turning wasted or orphaned or stranded energy into capital and value, you're earning Bitcoin. You're not earning the quacha. This is this is huge because everybody's like, well, why wouldn't why wouldn't they just do AI compute there? And it's like, okay, there's reasons. Like AI compute is not very sensitive to the price of electricity. Wouldn't make any sense to do in Bondo. There's bad latency. You need like really high bandwidth. But at the end of the day, one of the most important reasons why not is because for now at least. No one's going to pay you in Bitcoin for AI compute, but Bitcoin pays you in Bitcoin to mine Bitcoin, right? So the ability to pay directly into your wallet without having to deal with like Forex and wires and all this nonsense is so, so, so massive. So, you know, that final use case is um, is power and, and the realization that not Bitcoin mining wastes energy and that Bitcoin is, a, is not just a, a savings technology, it's not just a freedom technology. It's not just a commerce technology. It's an energy savings technology. And the fact that it does all four things is, is pretty remarkable. But when you study it closely, you start to see how they're all connected. Um, and this isn't to say that there aren't downsides that, 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 that we're all looking at. And you know, our, you know, there, are, there are some truths to some of the criticisms and we need to address those. And there are challenges to this thing. Like, well, how is it really gonna scale? Are we really going to get into the hands of everybody who needs it? Could it really be freedom technology if not everybody could have self-custodial on-chain Bitcoin? These are the good, the big questions that we need to answer right now. But if you ever read in the mainstream media or anywhere else again from some moronic columnist at The Guardian or wherever, and they say anywhere in the piece that Bitcoin has no use case, they're wrong. They're on the, the wrong side of history. And I mean... They should be embarrassed at this point. This is no longer 2014. This is 2024. Yeah, well, look, you're totally right. The misreporting is terrible. They're, I think the guy, the guy, news. Alex, Alex Wren, I think is his fake name. Fake news. Yeah, it's, it's fake, fake news. news. It's bullshit. But there is also another another audience for this. When you have somebody like Elizabeth Warren trying to crack down on Bitcoin because she's got an anti-crypto army, uh, I wonder if she's really aware of the second order effects of this, that she's actually impacting the the spread of freedom and you know, access to good money and all these things that are happening in countries outside America. She's, she's doing it from a point of privilege as well. I mean, we've always had, when we've had new technologies arise in humanity, we've always had people fight them. I mean, there's a there's a pessimist archive account on, on Twitter that's hmm. really great. And, and they're always sharing clips um, from when the electricity came out or when the airplane came out or when the computer came out or the credit, any kind of innovation that clearly is like good. Um, at the time, there's a lot of folks who say, no, this is going to be bad. Electricity, oh my gosh, it's going to put so many people out of work. That's literally what people said. They said it's going to put people out of work. I mean, what? Um, you know, they said that... Um, uh, or the Krugman with the internet. All that stuff. But the, the airplane's going to be dangerous, never going to work. And I mean, all these stupid things. And, and you know, that's what's happening with Bitcoin. I mean, hap- it's still happening with nuclear power, which is so important for civilization. But, pe- you know, certain people continue to doubt it for different reasons. Um, and it's going to happen. It's happening with Bitcoin, too. It's not it's not unique. Every new fundamental revolutionary technology comes with massive doubters. And it takes decades to, to silence them. And, or, you know, some of them will never be silenced. A hundred years from now, when Bitcoin is like the dominant currency in the world, there will be a small group of people who are like denialists or whatever. And that, that's always going to be true. There are people who will never take an airplane. There are people who won't use electricity. Um, the, today, you know, there are people who would rather live like, you know, disconnected. And, and you know what? Maybe there's some value to that. I don't know. And a hundred years from now, I don't know. You know, what will it be like to be, you know, like a tribe that's not using Bitcoin, but is using something else? 
I don't really know, but what I do know is that their civilizational advancement will be pretty low compared to the people who use Bitcoin. I mean, it's kind of similar. Yes, you could kind of think of maybe maybe these people are happier in some way because they're not, you know, advanced. I mean, this is sort of the narrative we're fed, right, by the media. Like, well, they're happier, you know. I don't I don't know about that. I mean, are they happy that they have a life expectancy of 30 and that if they get like some sort of disease, they die right away? Is that happy? Um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I certainly don't believe so. But, you know, this is what the Yuval Noah Harari people will tell you. Uh, you know, we were happier back then. I don't know. I don't know about that. Life is nasty and British and short. I'm not sure. But I'm sure those people will be around 100 years from now. And they'll be like a bunch of Bitcoin denialists and, and you know, but that'll be that. I mean, they'll be a small group. Today, unfortunately, they are the echo chamber. They are the dominant group. Um, we who understand what's happening with Bitcoin are a small group. But hopefully you know, we can just take these examples and, and and just go forward with them and just continue to talk about them and continue to share this knowledge and the wisdom that's been earned by by talking to people in these places and countries. Like I, if I had just stayed where I lived, whether it be in California or New York and just never talked to anybody outside of my little bubble, I would be so ignorant about Bitcoin. It, you have to be able to look beyond. You have to be able to go out and look. And I did it accidentally. I was, again, I was talking to all these people around the world that I've met for a different purpose. You know, I was talking to them about human rights advocacy that at the time I thought had no connection to finance or economics or anything like that. And I accidentally kind of stumbled into it, you know, and it, and it worked out. But, you know, you have to find a way to look beyond. And then and then only then do you see the real impact this thing is having. But, you know, I hope we've been able to put a bunch of good examples for people. Remember the three mantras, Right. We have financial privilege. Bitcoin is bad for dictators, not Bitcoin mining wastes energy. I mean, these are the ones I would just take home with you. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, onward. I have no questions. It's just a, a rare pleasure to just sit back and listen. I, I, I jumped in a couple of times. So I felt like, well, I've got to say something. <laughs> but honestly, Alex, uh, I love everything you do. HRF Thanks, is amazing. Um, I'm truly grateful to have you as someone who comes on the show and as a friend and for all the the yeah, place in the world I've visited and the things I've seen, you've opened my eyes to so much. We're just um, getting started. Yeah, I know. But look, uh, we are always here for you whenever, whatever you need. And just keep doing what you're doing because you are telling a huge part of the Bitcoin story um, kind of on your own sometimes and or leading a group of people. And it's just so important. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, Thank everybody. You.